Hello, cool cats, groovy chicks, and finger-popping daddies. Welcome to the Jazz Ranch. I'm your alter dominant ego man. You can call me Mr. Ego if you like. And you know, the KH, he's on vacation. He'd be coming home soon. But anyway, I'm taking over the channel. And you know, some subscribers have written to us and they said, you know, tell us more stories or anecdotes about the KH, you know, because he had uh, quite a history. But anyway, you know, the KH, he started out in business. He got a degree from BU. And he went into banking, you know, and he wasn't happy. So he went out to the West Coast and he came back and he said, I'm going to get into music. Well, he was hanging around in his local town on the coast here. And he went into this coffee house one night and he met these musicians that were from New York. They were playing at this coffee house and they, he sat in with them and they hired him to play the gig for the summer. Anyway, the flute player was the leader and he said to KH one night, he said, we got a gig over in uh, such and such a town at a club over there called the Morton House. And they went over there to play on a Saturday night, and they're playing a gig. And all of a sudden, this lady comes up to the bandstand, and she starts taking her clothes off. Well, what they didn't realize was they were backing up exotic dancers. That's what they called them. They were glorified strippers, whatever you want to call them. But if the KH's mother ever knew that, she, he would have been in really big trouble. But anyway, you know, what happened was one of the, they were on a break, and the singer came up and said, the flute ain't cutting it. You got to get a saxophone player in here right now. Anyway, so the flute player called up Hartford and he got Bobby Johnson to come down from Hartford. Anyway, Bobby Johnson came down, he saved the gig. And when he heard KH play, he said, Well, I got some gigs for you up in Hartford. So KH went up to Hartford to play with Bobby Johnson and them, and he got in with the in, the in crowd up there. Pretty soon he's in the house band in Hartford and he's backing up people like Chet Baker, you know, Clark Terry, Clifford Jordan, Jimmy Heath. Zoot Sims. He got to play with all these cats because they came in from, from New York to play at this club in Hartford and it was so easy to get there, you, you know, that's how it worked out. So anyway, if it wasn't for the strippers, the KH wouldn't have ever got into the music business. Now, he wouldn't be here today and you wouldn't be here. So there you have it. Now, oh, wait a minute. He's coming up the walkway. I'm seeing him. He's, he's going to be mad at me for telling that story. Oh, I'm sorry. Bye-bye. Hello, friends, Bye -bye. and welcome to the Jazz Ranch. I'm sorry about the ultra-dominant ego man, you know, he tries to take over and everything, and I'm sorry about that story that he told you, but it actually is true. And, you know, the alter ego sometimes uh, would tell you things that, or uh, would say things that you were not, uh, feel comfortable saying. I'm not comfortable telling that story, particularly if my mother was still around, but God rest her merry soul, she's not. So, at any rate, I uh, hope you enjoyed the story, it is true. And I was very lucky and fortunate in my younger years when I didn't know that much about jazz to play with some of the greats. And uh, through the years, um, that happened as well. So now, tonight, I have something for you special that is going to be helpful to beginner-level jazz players. And one of the problems we have is uh, getting the syncopation and the rhythm right on melodic lines. And also being able to spread out the harmony into two hands. So it's spread voicing. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video. And I hope it's helpful for you. Please write to me and let me know. So here we go now with a great song. It's a very popular song by Duke Ellington. And you all know it, I'm sure, called Don't Get Around Much Anymore. So here we go. Mm -hmm. These are pages from my book. This is chapter 15 on spread voicings. This is volume one of my book. And the way I've laid it out is I have theory and then I have an application of the theory in an example and then applying it to an actual song. So it's three steps. Theory, application to a, an example, and then 
applying it to a specific song that you want to learn. So in this case, the song is Don't Get Around Much Anymore. So I'm showing you how to convert the block chords now to spread voicings in three-part harmony, and then how to convert them into four-part harmony, and then how to use them on the song, and then on the next page you have the complete arrangement of the song. You know, so that's the, that's the layout. It's, uh, and it lies flat on the music stand. This is in three-ring binder. And you have the three-part harmony here in spread voicings, four-part four harmony here in spread voicings, and then some bass lines as well. So it's a complete arrangement, easy to play, don't get around much anymore. Now I'm going to go into specifics about the syncopation and the rhythm. First thing you want to understand in getting a professional sound is that you want to convert the, the block chord type of harmonization in the left hand to a spread voicing, which means you're going to be taking these scale tone sevenths now, which are block chords, one, three, five, seven, and taking maybe the middle part out and putting it up here like that. So you have this root seventh, then third and fifth, so it's spread out. Or you could play this as a tenth and then go up there and play the seventh up there. So, And I have these laid out for you in the book as to how to arrange the spread voicing. But in this particular case for Don't Get Around Much Anymore, which is a simple arrangement, if I did it as a block chord, it'd be... It's not so practical, but as a spread. Now I'm going to just use three notes. So I'm going to take the fifth out, use the bass note, the seventh and the third. So I'm going to have this. And that works nicely. That's what I did. Here. So the same thing there. You have root, seventh, and third. So that's a good way to spread out and it's still easy, relatively easy to play. Next thing that happens is I do a bass line. So I'm breaking it up with spread voicings. Now the left hand is pretty much playing the roots. And then I have these, these chords. So I'm going to explain that next. So in explaining the voicings, the essential thing now is just to understand that I'm taking block chords and I'm converting them to spreads by spreading out the harmony that way. And even on these little licks on the bridge, I'm going... I mean, on the end of the first ending, I'm doing that, and then on the second ending, I'm doing this. You see, so that's spreading out, having the bass note down lower, and you get a better sound than if you just were playing, uh, you know, if you're playing just block chords, you know, or this. It's not really that practical, but this really works nicely. And then on the bridge, I have four-part harmony, so I have root, fifth, third, and that's the melody note, which is the sixth. Then an F minor six there. Okay, so I have root six, flat three. So that's a nice way to spread the harmony out. And there I just have three notes there. Then back to four notes harmony. Then this. So this is an easy arrangement using the spread voicings, but now. I'm going to talk about the rhythms. That's the tricky part of this song, is understanding the syncopation. This basically easy arrangement of Don't Get Around Much Anymore is available on my website for free. But I'm also plugging my book, and if you get the book, you're going to get more information. You get the examples and the theory and everything else, so you'll understand more in depth. And if you get the combination of the videos and the book, they've got everything complete as far as uh, what I can show you. Uh, the first thing I, I try to do when I'm learning a song is just get the notes down, you know, so like you want to get all these notes. You don't worry about tempo or anything like that. Just get the notes. You understand them theoretically as well as just what they are. You're reading them, you know, like this is a C major 7, D minor 7, E flat minor 7, and how they're harmonized, you know. In other words, these are root 7th, 3rd, root 7th, 3rd, root 7th, 3rd, like that. You want to just, when, you, when you understand the theory of the spread voicing, then you are getting, you know, you how to apply it to future songs, and everything gets a lot easier as you go along and learn more. Now, in the dis, so it ascends, right, harmonically, then it descends in the bass line. So, now, these are dominant sevens, because there's the flat seven there. Right down uh, chromatically from C7 to A7. Then, when you have a bass line with some thirds here, now, I don't worry about rhythm yet. Just get the notes. You can even practice it very slowly, like. Don't think about rhythm. Just get all the notes right.
sometimes it's just good to practice something emphatically that way rather than um, try to play it exactly the way it's written first. Just get those notes and the, the fingerings. See, here it goes, five, four, and now I'm crossing three, one, now I'm crossing. You have to get that finger, whatever's comfortable for you. That crossing, you know, and this one, that's pretty straightforward. Like that. Okay, now, once you get that, then you get the next, the bridge, you know, like the bridge is a little easier. Because it's just four part harmony. No bass line movement, but. Okay, so now we'll, I'm going to talk about the rhythmic aspect of the melody now. Let's go with that. Okay, some essential things now, and let's use the metronome. Okay, so like if it's, if you're playing on the beat, let's go to 120, well, whatever, close to it. On the beat, off the beat. So you can reduce most of what you're doing to those two factors, either on or off. And um, they can be placed anywhere if, there, you know, there's eight eighth notes in a measure. So the, out of those eight eighth notes, the note can fall on any of them, either on the beat, right on the beat, or, or off the beat, or combinations of them. So the way this melody starts out, it starts out with the first two notes being off the beat, then the next, the next four being on and off, their eighth note. So you have one and one and two and, right, one and two and three and four and. Now you have to be able to count the rhythm in order to understand it. I always tell my students, if you can't count it, then you're not understanding it. You know, you want to count, be able, you're understanding it intellectually when you can count it. Then you have to go beyond that and understand it feel-wise. You know, and just begin to understand, of course, uh, straight eights versus swing eights. Like, straight eights are this. You know, that's not what we want. We want swing eights. Now, what's the difference? Well, the first eight gets more value than the second eight. So it's like... You don't want it to sound sing-song, but you do want that... If I played it even, it'd be, you know, it'd be like a, a rock and roll or, you know, Latin music is more straight eights. Jazz swing is the syncopated eights. In other words, they are swing eights. In other words, the first one gets twice the value of the second. Or you can divide it into thirds and say it gets two-thirds of the value and the, and the second one gets one-third. And this is explained better in my book than I can right now. But you, you can see, hear the difference, right? That's swinging it, not swinging it would be... Or... That would be even eights. Swing eights. Now, counting it. One, and two, and three, and four, and... See, that's ahead of the beat. So I always think of those offbeats as be being a little bit ahead of the downbeat. That's a good way to think of them. So that's the first phrase. Here's we'll the metronome set on 120 for the quarter note. One, two, one, two, three, four, one.
Now I'm putting the metronome on 60 for the two and four. So this is going to help it to swing better. So here we go. One, two, one. So now what's fascinating about this song is you have this melody. And then you have like sort of a response, like call and response idea. In other words, that's the statement now, the, it responds to it chordally. It's the descending, and then an ascending line responds. It's a little bit different, but it's very similar in a lot of ways because this is one and, and the same thing with the chord, one and, right? So one. But the second one is one and two, three, four and. See, so you have to be able to count it. If you can't count it, you'll never get it. You can never understand it. Well, some people are just naturally talented with syncopation, so they get they feel it the right way immediately without intellectualizing. I'm intellectualizing it because that's easier for me to understand it in a, in a in a you know thinking way, and then forget about that and just feel it later on. But you know, you have this. Then that's the call, the response is, which is really cool. So now it goes one and two, three, four and. So you have to get those on beats and off beats. You know, one, that's off the beat. One and two, on the beat, and then on the beat, and then off. See, one and two, three, four. You know, I can't emphasize this enough because it's the thing that is always the trickiest for students to get, particularly if you're not. If you don't listen to a lot of jazz or you're just getting into jazz or you've been playing classical music, whatever it may be, to get this syncopation and get it to feel right, um, not only does it take intellectualizing and understanding it and feeling it, but it takes listening to a lot of jazz so you begin to imitate people who are doing it really well. And that's, that's understanding it in depth. You, so you have to, all, the, have to, all these things have to be happening where you have to understand it in a variety of ways, including listening to records. You need to listen to people, to great jazz pianists, and then the way I'm doing it and so on. And, you know, I'm not the greatest. I'm just like an ordinary guy. But, I mean, you know, this is my concept. This is the way I, I hear it, you know. So I practice all of these things by, in three ways, by intellectualizing them, by playing them and try to get a feel for them, and then also listen to records and try to imitate other players that are really excellent players. So as I was breaking it down, you know, like you have eight eighth notes in a measure, and a a melody note can end on or uh, you know hit on any of those eighth notes and either be a downbeat or an upbeat. So on the first bridge we have now the hits right on one, right one and two and three and four and one. But the next one hits on the up, one and two, okay, and the next one hits on the down, one go. One and two, three, four, and the, and the last one, the third note, uh, chord, hits on the up of four. So we're counting it like this. One and two, three, four, and. Yeah, see, that's the, that's the thing that you need to be able to feel. You know, now you need to be able to play that and feel time against it. You know, you're feeling the beat, so like the beat is in there. You know, now we can we can put it in like you know on the 120, one, like that. You have to feel that against the beat. What that's hitting on the quarter notes. One, two, three, four. One and two, three, four, and. Okay, now the second ending it goes like this. 
one and two, three, four and. Let me see. So those ands, I like to think of them. There's two ways you can think of them. Uh, those ands that like one and two. I think of that as the second half of beat one. One falling after one. One and two, three and then four and. So that four and you can think of it as the end of four, but you can also think of it as anticipating one of the next measure, and, and I like to think of it that way because it really is the, to me it's hitting the, uh, ahead, of the ahead of the beat. This is one's behind, behind, the, behind the, the uh, quarter note. One and two, three, four, and that one's ahead of the quarter note of the f next measure. That's, that's an interesting uh, and tricky little uh, thing there, but I hope that you understand what I'm saying. Now we'll go into you know the these little tips that I'm giving you are just my way of looking at it. You know, if you talk to 20 piano teachers or 20 jazz pianists, you may get 20 different answers to how they look at it. You know, so this is just the way I look at it and the way I've learned things. And you know, one man's meat is another man's poison. So we get to the bridge now, it's right on the beat. I put those right on the beat, right on the beat, and then this is on the beat. But the next one's off the beat. And the next one's off the beat. So you have one, two, three, and four, and, you see? Now, you want to count it, but you also want to feel it. You don't want everything to land on, on the beat, otherwise it sounds like this. Which is lame, right? That's not swinging. You want, you want... So the most important way to learn how to do that is to be able to play it against a metronome. You know, you, you have to be able to feel the beat or beat your foot, whatever it makes you, allows you to feel the beat and play against it. Like one, two, three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, like, like that. Now, this may sound elementary to some of you, but, you know, for people having trouble with playing rhythm or offbeats or jazz rhythms, then this is a huge issue, you know, and it was for me, it was for uh, most of the students I've had, you know, uh, on, an, on an average other than the gifted ones or the, you know, ones that just naturally have talent, is, to, is the rhythm. Get the rhythm, you know, like one and two and three to get those beats and, like, not get off the time, you know, not rush stay right on the on the groove you know let's put it on two and four and like see what it should sound like you see one two I'll get the rhythm you see that's that's it and you want to be it wants to be relaxed and also, the notes want to be legato. I mean, jazz, it's legato. In jazz phrasing, it's legato. It's elongated. And, and, and unless you want a staccato, like you might want, you might want that to be. Mm. But those, the rest of them are legato. It's a legato. That one's staccato, right? So th there you have it. You, so you have your legato, you have your staccato, and you have your rhythm. And your upbeats and your offbeats, onbeats and offbeats, you have all that combined into a nice jazz salad, you know, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. Now, we could play an intro like this. Like that, we could do that. You see, I put the bass note down an octave lower. And also, we do have an ending here, so let's look at that. So, like the last time it goes... So you have one and two, three, four, and that same same kind of line that's in the second ending. And then a little additional measure in there to give it a sense of finality. Okay. Now, when you get really good at this playing this song, you might want to go on, graduate, as we say, to a higher level and play it with a backing track. Now, you can get these free off of YouTube. Or you can get band in the box, or you can program, you know, certain uh, software to give you a backing track. Now, this is better than a metronome in some ways. You're playing with a bass player and a drummer. 
And this one comes from YouTube, so I'm going to be playing some improvisation as well. I'm going to try to keep it simple for the first chorus and then make it more complex so you can hear some ideas that I have about improvising. So here we go now with uh, using a backing track for Don't Get Around Much Anymore.
Wrapping up, that's it from the Jazz Ranch for tonight. And thanks so much for joining me. Please write to me. I love to hear from you. And I always try to respond to comments. You know, it takes me a while to catch up sometimes because I get a lot of comments. So, and also emails. So I, be, please be patient and I will get back to you when I can. And if I don't get back to you, then write to me again to remind me to get back to you. So that's easy, right? So until next time, I will say in the words of my great friend, Hermie Dressel, swing loose. And we'll see you next time around. Bye-bye.